Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Students and fellow staff members of a former Brandeis High School teacher killed in a car wreck on Friday say that her influence and the lessons she taught extended far beyond the classroom. Tonight, her family is planning a funeral, but as Devin Clark explains, those who spoke up about the 36-year-old mother say her legacy will never die. She was an absolute one of a kind. Considered a loving mother, wife, and dedicated educator, it seems former Brandeis High School teacher Carissa Kahutek made a great impression on everyone she met. Even as te also teachers, we'd look at her like, how do you do it? I mean, she just juggled everything. Teacher Scott Coleman once taught in the same department as Kahutek, but says she was more like family rather than a co-worker. She was the kind of person that was always happy. She was always in a good mood. If she wasn't in a good mood, you didn't know it. She was um, a ray of sunshine. She brought kindness into our classroom every single day. Kirsten Ayer says she looked forward to going to Kahootek's economics class her senior year. Economics was not my strong subject, but I learned it in a way that I could remember it and retain it when I got older. And I just remember her always being so excited when we did great on our tests. Around 6.30 Friday evening, investigators say Kahutek lost her life after exiting I-10 near UTSA Boulevard and crashing into a ditch. Tonight, an online digital memory book is growing with kind sentiments and stories. Many say Kahutek's influence will continue to resonate even in her absence. She even taught me, you know, you can choose your attitude. You can you can do it with a frown or you can do it with a smile. And she always did it with a smile. Even though Kahutek most recently worked at UTSA, the emotion can be felt here in the halls at Brandeis High School. Several staff members tell me that they've reached out to Kahutek's family to see what they can do to help. Reporting outside of Brandeis, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf now asking organizers to postpone the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo less than two weeks from when it's supposed to kick off. The judge sent a letter to the board chairwoman on Monday making that request. Our Garrett Berger joins us live from Freeman Coliseum where the rodeo is supposed to be happening this year. So Garrett, does the judge want to delay the entire event or just part of it? Well, it's not completely clear from the letter that he sent yesterday, and we weren't able to confirm with the judge himself. However, it does not appear that he's too worried about the stock show side of things. What he's concerned about are the rodeo events and concerts that would be happening in the Freeman Coliseum itself. Now, the stock show would be taking place in the nearby barns on the same grounds, where the rodeo estimates at least 10,000 exhibitors will come through over the course of the entire rodeo, along with the limited number of guests that they can bring. But in his Monday letter, the judge mainly referred to the events in the Coliseum, which will have an attendance cap of about 3,800 people at any one time. In his letter, the judge pointed to the high local COVID-19 case rates and said safety protocols would be difficult to enforce. However, he also acknowledged that organizers are within their rights to proceed, and it certainly seems like they plan to. A rodeo spokeswoman told KSAT in an email, quote, The safety of our rodeo athletes, patrons, and volunteers is of utmost importance to our sporting event that raises funds to help educate the youth of Texas. The precautionary measures we are implementing during the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo not only adheres to, but also exceeds current local and state health guidelines. Now, we're expecting to hear from the judge tonight during the nightly briefing about his request and what he thinks to the rodeo response that'll be coming up in just a little bit stay tuned after the break live at freeman coliseum i'm garrett Berger, ksat 12 news thank you garrett you can add the king william fair to the list of fiesta events affected by the ongoing pandemic organizers say it is not going to happen this year due to safety concerns the announcement came a day after fiesta san antonio officials confirmed other fiesta 2021 events are being postponed until june the Battle of Flowers and Fiesta Flambeau parades, however, will be canceled entirely this year. The Fiesta, Fiesta Oyster Bake also canceled. For a complete list of events affected so far, check out our website at ksat.com. The delay in vaccine shipments for the mass vaccination site at the Alamo Dome could mean further delays until new appointments can now be scheduled. The city announced yesterday a delivery delay would push second dose appointments at the Alamo Dome for today through Thursday back to February 16th through the 18th. A Metro Health spokeswoman told KSAT today that most appointments for first doses will not resume until after that. The city isn't getting enough doses yet to handle new patients on top of the ones who already need a second dose, she said, though that could change if more vaccine doses start coming in. 
In the meantime, occasional appointments for a first dose could still pop up on the city's website due to any missed appointments. It knew at six, the number of backlogged court cases as a result of the moratorium on jury service has soared now at 66%. Paul Venema takes us through the numbers and a look at what it will take to bring them back down. Since last March, when the jury service moratorium was ordered, remote hearings and an occasional sentencing were the only courtroom business conducted. That's generated a huge case backlog. Any backlog in the justice system is alarming. Take a look at the numbers that local administrative judge Ron Renhel is talking about. Indicted felony cases are up two-thirds since the pandemic began, 66 percent. The pending misdemeanor backlog, too, has reached reached alarming numbers. The backlogs include a pretty significant number of individuals that we consider to be fugitives. 11,446, to be exact. Given these numbers, are you going to take another look at uh, resuming jury trials anytime soon, in-person jury trials? I want to make sure that before we delve into starting in-person jury trials, that, that the local health conditions indicate that we're at a certain level that's here to stay. He predicted that once we hit that level, things will move quickly. Not only will we have jury trials at a very fast clip, but I think that the individual parties are going to come to agreements fairly rapidly. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, police in New Braunfels investigating a pair of overnight convenience store robberies. They're looking for some help identifying the suspect here. This is the guy that police are looking for. The first robbery happened just before 1 a.m. at the 7-Eleven in the 800 block of FM 306. Police say the suspect had a pistol and demanded money from the register, then took off once he got it. About 20 minutes later, the second pack store in the 1400 block of Highway 46 South a similar scenario played out there. No injuries were reported. Anyone who can help New Braunfels police identify this guy is asked to call NBPD or Comal County Crime Stoppers. That number is 830-620-TIPS. New information now. We've learned the name of a man who was killed when he was run over by his own 18-wheeler yesterday morning. The medical examiner's office says that man was 46-year-old Jose Luis Villarreal Jr. According to a BCSO sergeant, Villarreal was along Highway 90 pumping a tire with air when the truck began to roll backwards, crushing him in the process. It's unclear why that truck began to move on its own. Time saver traffic right now. This is the TransGuide camera at Highway 90 in Medio, Medio Creek, and you can see that there's an accident uh, on the median there. At least one vehicle involved. Emergency uh, personnel on the scene as well. It's slowing down traffic a little bit because one lane is blocked. Again, this is US 90 at Medio Creek. At Harlandale ISD, the role of social workers is crucial, especially now. They serve as a link between family, schools, and community services. Nine additional social workers were hired this school year, and the district says that's been a big help. Tiffany Huertas has more on how they are helping families in need. Unfortunately, we did lose a teacher this weekend, and Brian had his team of social workers and counselors available for that campus. Brian Jacklich is the social worker coordinator at Harlandale ISD. We send a crisis team. We have three different teams made up of counselors and social workers, and they rotate as situations happen. Jacklich says students are dealing with a number of issues that makes it difficult to focus on school. We see a lot of depression just because in grief issues and loss. Last year, the district had a total of 15 social workers. This year, they have a total of 24. This was in play before we even knew about the pandemic. Our families rely on us for all types of support services. The percentage rate of economically disadvantaged students in Harlandale ISD is 89%. The role of social workers is to remove all the barriers that prevent a student from being successful in school. During the pandemic, they have been doing home visits and connecting families to different resources. So the initial plan might be just to get them the resources they need, um, you know, to get by, you know, financially and economically. If it's just food or some clothes or to help with funeral arrangements or to contact them or connect them with people in the community who can help them with those things. Uh, we also do a lot of referrals for counseling. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening. Ooh, look at that one. 
It's a good sunset out there. 65 degrees, rounding out a pretty pleasant day, Adam. Yeah, it's another week where we have those mid and high clouds streaming in from the Pacific, so it gives us these gorgeous sunsets and even some sunrises as well. Taking a look at our day today, we started at 39 degrees in San Antonio, but there were parts of our area that were at and below freezing. Even just outside the hill country, we saw some isolated freezes. That's not going to be the case tonight. Right now, temperature at 64 degrees, down two from our high temperature of 66. And our dew point's at 28, so still fairly dry air in place. South wind at only eight miles per hour. Pleasant out there this evening. Widespread 60s, Bernie 61. You get to 67 in Pleasanton, 62 Canyon Lake. New Braunfels right now at 64 degrees, even hanging on to 70 closer to the Rio Grande from Del Rio to Carrizo Springs and Catula now at 71 tomorrow morning. Most of us in the 40s, we could see some upper 30s in the hill country, but I think most of us in the mid 40s. Then by the afternoon, we warm well into the 70s, even hitting 80 degrees south down I 35. We get even warmer as we get into Thursday. We'll talk about that. Then what a series of cold fronts will do to our temperatures coming right up. Just about time now for the daily briefing on COVID-19 cases in our area. Expecting to hear from the county judge about that postponement request he's made for the rodeo. Let's go listen in. Public Health Authority, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 1,260 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our cumulative total to 176,790 since the pandemic began. Our seven-day rolling average is up slightly, but still uh, below that 2,000 mark that we want, that we had hit earlier. Uh, it's now at 1,510. Unfortunately, we are also reporting 15 new deaths uh, this evening, and that brings our total lives lost to 2,167. Uh, many of these are neighbors you might know, and um, we have lost too many of our friends and family during this pandemic, and so please keep them, their families, and survivors in your prayers this evening. In our hospitals, uh, they are rem remaining relatively stable. There are 1,176 patients being treated for COVID-19 in our local hospitals. That's up slightly five uh, from yesterday. There were 138 new admissions in the last 24 hours, 399 in intensive care, and 232 folks on ventilators. Based on our progress and warning indicators that we shared last night, the school indicator bar remains in the red high risk level. However, we know it's important for kids to be in school and the Centers for Disease Control has issued new detailed operational guidance for teachers, coaches, janitors, and other school staff on how to keep schools open safely. For example, in addition to basic protocols such as mask wearing and social distancing, there should be no contact sports in the red zone while the community uh, is experiencing high spread. The Metro Health Department has issued an amended directive uh, to, related to schools and teachers and school administrators and parents can find it on the city's COVID-19 website. That's covid19.sanantonio.gov. Very quickly before I turn it over to the judge, this Friday will be the last day that the AT&T Center will serve as a COVID-19 testing site. Community Labs, the nonprofit organization formed to provide COVID-19 screenings for asymptomatic individuals, announced that two new sites will, will now offer free self-administered PCR tests to the general public. Those sites are the Bar Shop Jewish Community Center on Northwest Military Highway, and that starts on February 8th, and Rackspace Technology, that's off I-35 in Walsham, that one begins on February 9th. Let me turn it now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mayor. And, you know, the last two days, hospitalizations have been about the same, a little bit rise, not much. And uh, we did have a bump up of 39 more people being admitted for COVID. So uh, I don't think that's saying that we're not going to continue to improve, uh, but uh, a little bit of difference to the last couple of days. Uh, but we just need to continue to be uh, diligent in what we're doing. Uh, and as we've mentioned before, there's other iterations of the uh, mutations of the uh, COVID in the United States. Not sure what will, what's here or what might come here. But uh, I was reading today where in Brazil that uh, it's spreading uh, four times faster in one of the cities that's two million or more. And it's a, have a lot more serious cases for young people. So we, we need to continue to be um, very, very, very careful. Uh, let me give uh, some uh, recognition and, and uh, 
say to University Hospital, we're very proud of you. Um, the Bear County Hospital District has been recognized by the American uh, Central Hospitals as a model for va uh, mass uh, vaccinations. Uh, in fact, they're going to have a seminar to all their members across the United States. And in that seminar, George Hernandez, president of the University Hospital, and Bill Phillips, who's been handling all of the uh, vaccinations, uh, will be there along with Lenny Kirkman, who heads up our uh, public relations. So uh, congratulations to all of you. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, I was out at the site day before yesterday, I guess now. And uh, uh, things are moving so quickly and easy there. It, it, there's no lines hardly, but uh, we vaccinated over 3,000 people yesterday between upstairs and downstairs, another f 500 at the Robert B. Green. So things are moving along very well and getting the vaccination this week being the second shot. So moving along pretty good. Great. Thank you, Judge. And uh, just a brief update. We mentioned a program, our Seniors First Home program, which is in conjunction with Saha, Meals on Wheels, and our own San Antonio Fire Department, which has been administering vaccines during Meals on Wheels delivery. Uh, wanted to give you an update on that program. We have now vaccinated 380 of our homebound seniors in this community. And that, again, is an innovative program started in partnership with the state and those organizations. All right, that's the very latest from the mayor and the county judge. 1,260 new cases and the seven day average went up to 1,510 uh, per 24 hours. Uh, the 15 new deaths bringing the total to 2,167. Other trends, though, remain stable. Numbers in the hospital remain pretty steady. One thing we did not hear was the county judge address that request that he made uh, to the organizers of the stock show and rodeo to delay it less than two weeks uh, from when it is set to begin. If any questions are asked about that very topic, we have people covering that and we'll of course update that uh, as soon as we get any new information of course, on our website as well. But uh, the mayor also did mention something when it comes to schools. On Tuesday, he always talks about the risk for in-person learning in schools. He said the risk remains high, but he directed parents, administrators uh, to the Metro Health website for some new guidance that the CDC has put out, uh, an amended directive for Metro Health. So we're going to talk to the mayor coming up a little bit later. Hopefully, we'll be able to ask him for some clarification on that new information. Yeah, a little surprised the judge didn't address the letter to postpone the rodeo, but yes. I'm sure it will be asked in the question part and mm -hmm. we will bring you his reaction hopefully a little bit later in this newscast. All right, let's move over to weather right now quickly because it is a changing situation out there, Adam. It is and we're changing upward in terms of temperatures for the next couple of days and then we see a bit of a dive. Uh, let's take a look at the readings out there right now. You look at temperatures mostly in the 60s, still closer to 70 west of San Antonio, especially right along the Rio Grande. 64 Hondo, 64 for San Antonio. There is some cooler air out there. We just don't have that Arctic air in place yet. The Arctic air is up in Canada. That's where we've got temperatures well below freezing, uh, below zero, I should say. Yes, well below freezing, but below zero as well. That Arctic air is going to plunge southward later this week and into the weekend. What does that mean for us? It looks like we'll get clipped by it. Thursday's our warmest day at 80 degrees. Then we just get clipped by that Arctic air mass with the core of the cold air staying off to the north of us. So I don't think this Arctic air mass is really going to make all that much progress southward and have a big impact on our temperatures. It'll knock us from about 80 degrees on Thursday back down near average in the 60s for Friday. Then another little dent in our temperatures as we get into Sunday, a little closer to 60 or in the lower 60s. Still an active pattern. Pacific Northwest and especially along the East Coast. You've seen the national stories about the more than a foot of snow in parts of New England and uh, even New York area. For us, big blue H over Mexico, clockwise rotation around it. So we're getting this stream of moisture off the Pacific, which is just translating to some areas of clouds, which make for our beautiful and colorful sunsets and sunrises. This evening by 10 p.m. 52 midnight 47 not as cold tomorrow morning 45 to start the day could be a little bit of patchy fog otherwise sunny and 73 so another comfortable day Thursday up near 80 and then you see that temperatures the temperatures drop off and unfortunately despite cold fronts no chance of rain. Mm. All right thanks Adam. All right a big question for the Spurs how do they bounce back 
from back-to-back blowouts. Yeah, and, and this is a young team, remember, and does it shake their confidence? We're going to put that question to the Spurs veterans here when we come back. And also after back-to-back blowouts, we'll also begin our coverage here of Black History Month with the Admiral David Robinson and his family legacy that continues to grow in this city coming up. suffered consecutive losses this bad to one team all season long until now. Saturday, they were routed by the Memphis Grizzlies, 129-112 to 112 on Saturday night. Again, last night, 133-102. to 102. That's a combined 48 points with the Grizzlies shooting 57% Saturday, 56% last night, 50% from three-point range. Turnovers, again, a big problem for the Spurs as the Grizzlies forced 15 on 11 steals that resulted in 30 points. Veteran DeMar DeRozan was asked if it's tough to recover from two back-to-back blowouts, shaking the confidence for a young team. Definitely a resilient group. You know, guys more so get more um, frustrated and want to redeem themselves. Um, like I said, it's a long season. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a season of up and downs. But, you know, when you hit the, when you hit the lows, you got to understand how to build back up from it and be stronger. So um, we got a lot of resilient guys that understand it. Now some more bad news. The Spurs telling us late this afternoon that LaMarcus Aldridge will miss his fourth game of the season with soreness in his right hip. That's tomorrow against Minnesota at 730. To help celebrate Black History Month, we were given unprecedented access to the Admiral David Robinson and one of his sons, David Jr., to visit with them about the Robinson family legacy, especially off the court. Now here's something you may not know. The Carver Academy, started by David and his wife Valerie back in 2001, is now known as the Idea Carver College Prep, going from a private school to a public charter school in 2012. And now with multiple campuses all over San Antonio, the first thing that grabs your attention is how much the Carver campus has grown from its original campus to a much bigger building across the street that houses the David Robinson Museum to inspire all of their students to what they can achieve. Here's one of our first questions we put to David today. Aside from your family, is this your pride and joy for you and Valerie both? Uh, one of them, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously being with the Spurs, you, 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 that's got to be a big pride and joy. I mean, to have 25 years of ridiculous success that we've had in, in a small market it defies all odds. Uh, but, but Carver Academy and IDEA also defies all odds. I mean, when you think about the numbers that are out there and, you know, you, you know on one side of the highway, 75% of those kids are going to college. And on the other side, 10%. So to... to, to defy those kind of odds and say, we're sending 100% of these kids to college. And, and that's a phenomenal thing. So it is one of, one of my life's exciting, most exciting works. All right, we thought this was going to be just one story, but given the access, we have decided to share this with you all month long and on Instant Replay. David talks about his idols growing up as a black American, as well as the David Robinson Fellowship that has funded a college education for 10 deserving students a year. His son, David Jr., will tell us why he's returned to San Antonio to help carry on the family legacy that has helped thousands of students get a chance to go to college. Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. All right, you may remember we told you yesterday the Kansas City Chiefs had to place two players on the COVID-19 close contact list, and today we're finding out why just days before Super Bowl 55 in Tampa. That's because wide receiver Demarcus Robinson and backup center Daniel Kilgore, after close contact with a barber, hired to come in and give haircuts to the players who are on lockdown. That barber reportedly tested positive for the coronavirus. The two players can still suit up Sunday if they test negative. The rest of the week, you're in a bubble, you, you lock down and they even tested the barber. But here's the thing. He started the haircuts before the test came back positive. Oh, so he apparently got through two he got players. one and was starting on the second. Test came back. Wow. Yep. Thanks, Greg. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back. At three expected executive orders give an overview of the Biden administration's immigration priorities. They contrast from former President Donald Trump's, as you might imagine. And as Karen Kaifa reports, the White House continues to eye action on President Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID relief proposal. The next target for President Joe Biden's executive orders, the immigration policies of his predecessor, Donald Trump. These actions are centered on the basic premise that our country is safer, stronger, and more prosperous with a fair, safe, and orderly immigration system. Biden's orders Tuesday will call for a cross-agency task force led by the Department of Homeland Security aimed at reuniting families separated at the U.S.-Mexico border under Trump administration policy. 
and call for support to Central American countries for initiatives aimed at stemming the flow of migrants to the U.S.-Mexico border and to restore the asylum system, as well as a review of the legal immigration system. Also Tuesday, Biden and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen joining Senate Democrats for a virtual lunch to talk about Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID economic rescue plan. The president met with a group of Republican senators Monday, hearing their counteroffer for a $618 billion package. I think it was an excellent meeting. Senate Democrats Tuesday charting procedural steps forward for Biden's plan, as is. We are not going to dilute, dither, or delay. With the White House not eager to negotiate down. Now, Democrats across uh, the Congress and in the White House, um, we've long recognized that the danger is not doing too much, it's doing too little. In Washington, I'm Karen Kefa. New at six, as the COVID vaccine rollout slowly takes shape, we can't let our guards down. Scientists are identifying what makes one person more likely to spread the virus than another. Ursula Perry with what makes a super spreader. Three. From rocket propulsion Zero. to sneeze propulsion. <laughs> These mechanical engineers are adapting their skills in the fight against COVID. Fluid properties drive how well things turn into aerosols. In their study, researchers used computer-generated models with intricate geometry to numerically simulate different sneezes. The sneeze is very complicated. So what makes you a super spreader? Turns out age and gender. Young men are most likely to spread COVID because of their thin saliva that can linger in the air. Also, a full set of teeth can actually cause sneezes to go much farther. You can think of this in the context of a hose, a garden hose, and if you stick your thumb over it, it leads a spray that goes out much further than without. Congestion can also cause sneezes to increase in velocity. The study showed that sneezes with a full set of teeth and a stuffed up nose went 60% farther than other models. We're doing this study primarily so that we could engineer this, this saliva alteration mechanism. The researchers have come up with an interesting idea. They are asking an outside company to come up with a saliva thickening candy, something you could eat that would impede the transmission of the coronavirus. At least something sweet while you wait to get your vaccine. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Next right. up there today, but we got a little temperature spike heading this way. More than a little. We do. We it's do. going up before it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got it down. We got it down. Yes. Yeah, we do have some temperature fluctuations to talk about, though I don't think it's going to be quite as extreme as we previously thought. And we're going to talk about that Arctic air, where it's going to be and why. But not as cold tonight. You know, last night we actually dipped down to freezing in a few locations, especially in the hill country. Not as cold tonight. We'll be down in the 40s for lows for most of us. 80 degrees on Thursday. Then we drop off and here's some good news. Mountain cedar season is starting to wind down and I want to talk about that right now. Here's a look at our typical mountain cedar season, which speaks, which speaks. Well, it speaks to us in a northerly wind. I don't I can't go anywhere with this. Sorry, the hill country breeze. The cedar speaks. We recovered that a little bit, so it peaks usually in mid January, then ends around Valentine's Day. Here we are early February. This is also a reminder to fellow guys out there. Valentine's Day right around the corner. Uh, we do have it on the low end today with a count of 30. And this doesn't mean that we won't necessarily see a little spike here and there between now and really the next couple of weeks, but odds are against it and the worst of it should be done with. Take a look at our beautiful sky this evening. This is out over Medina Lake. Nice shot there. High clouds providing good, good photogenic sky this evening. And we captured it on our time lapse. And these clouds are coming up and around an upper level high that's that's directing this moisture from the Pacific Ocean. So we started our day today at 39 in San Antonio, topped out at 66. That's just one degree above average. Dew points are down, fairly dry air. Dew points right around 30. So it's comfortable out there. The lack of humidity. Humidity will increase a little bit, and the importance of that is it's not going to feel humid outside, but by Thursday morning with little added moisture, I think we could have some fog. Then we get into early next week. I know it's a long ways away, but about six, seven days from now, we could be dealing with some morning fog and maybe some drizzle. Otherwise, 
comfortable with the lack of humidity. Across the state, 60s, even some 70s, Midland at 72, beautiful Alpine at 70, along with Del Rio and Dallas now at 59. And yes, there is some colder air across the country at this moment. And some locations just barely below freezing. You get around the Midwest and the Great Lakes and even New England. But the real Arctic air that's bottled up in Canada is going to be pushing southward. I mean, we're talking temperatures in the double digits below zero right now in northern Canada. That Arctic air is going to be plunging southward by the end of this week and even into the upcoming weekend. So what does that mean for us? Well, around here, it's going to be warm on Thursday. That's our peak. 80 degrees for the high temperature. Then we just get clipped by that Arctic air. So this isn't the kind of Arctic air that just gets funneled right down the plains and then we see a big, big chill here in Texas. That's not going to be the case. The big chill is going to stay bottled up to the north. What do I mean by big chill? 30 to 40 below zero air temperatures closer to the Canadian border for a few mornings by this weekend and into next week around here. We're just getting clipped by it. So we go into the 70s tomorrow, 80 degrees Thursday, then back to average in the 60s by Friday. The front basically just resets us back to where we should be this time of year. Then it dents our weather again, our temperatures as we get into Sunday in the lower 60s. Some activity out there. West Coast, more moisture coming on shore. East Coast, still that nor'easter. Just like yesterday, it's stalled out now and it's still dumping snow in parts of New England. But for us, I mentioned that moisture aloft coming off the Pacific because this big blue H, big upper level high over Mexico, clockwise circulation that's steering those clouds from the Pacific right over Texas. So gives us good sunrises and sunsets, but doesn't give us any needed rainfall. Rain chances are slim to none here for at least the next six to seven days. Tomorrow morning we start the day at 45. Little bit of patchy fog, but I don't think it's going to be problematic for the morning commute. Then we make it into the low 70s for highs south breeze at 10 to 15. Thursday we mentioned that's the warmest day of the week right up near 80 and then we cool off for Friday into the weekend. Despite those temperature changes and cold fronts, rain chances really not existent still little hint of spring later in the week. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adam. We'll have our case at Q&A with Mayor Ron Nuremberg after the break. It is time for our KSAT Q&A, and on Tuesdays, we are pleased to be joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Mayor, thank you for making time for us today. I, I want to talk about the trends right off the top. It seems as if they're stabilizing and going down. Is there a concern? I know a lot of the concerns are around the holidays. Is there also a concern because the weather's been so nice that this could lead to a spike in cases that we're seeing? You know, actually, it's a little bit of the opposite. We, we, we do know, uh, or I think there's suspicion that because of the very cold weather in northern climates, especially, there was a, quite a bit of a spike because people went back into their homes and stayed confined in small places and had people over. And, and then we, we say a lot of spread that way. Uh, but no, I think you're right. There are encouraging signs that the trends are moving in the right direction. Um, but it is very important that we stay vigilant for a few reasons. One, we don't want to obviously go backwards. But we're in a bit of a race now because we need to get vaccines as out as fast as we possibly can. And we're limited by doses. And we know that these variants that are starting to be introduced in the community can potentially pose some complications with immunity and also, uh, you know, basically outrun us if we let it in terms of community spread. The vaccine is still something that we get questions, such a variety of questions about every single day. One we continue to get is if someone doesn't live in San Antonio, let's say they live in one of our surrounding communities, can they come to San Antonio and get a vaccine administered by the city? You know, the state prevents us from uh, requiring proof of residency. Uh, so that obviously is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but the, the STRAC region is uh, essentially our home base. And while we are getting doses allocated for Bear County, and we hope people that are getting these uh, doses are residents of Bear County, they, they, you know, the state limits us in terms of uh, the proof that we, can pro that we can require. If someone is in another county, though, they should go to their own hospital, their own providers to get that dose, because 
Again, these doses are being allocated by the state based on the region that you're in, and, and we only have so many uh, for our own Bear County residents. A lot of questions yesterday. You, you uh, announced the homebound senior program and uh, for people that can't get out, that are stuck at their home for various reasons. A explain a little bit about that. And we've been getting a lot of questions for people wondering if they can sign up their loved ones for this homebound yeah. program. Yeah, you're, it, this is a program that's being conducted uh, as a pilot uh, with state allocated doses of the vaccine. And it's being done in conjunction with the San Antonio Housing Authority, which is roughly 75 percent of the population that we are vaccinating in this manner, along with Meals on Wheels and the Metropolitan Health District. And the folks that are actually delivering these vaccines are EMTs with the city of San Antonio from the fire department. Uh, they are pre-registered. Uh, we know who they are. They are homebound and receiving meal delivery as their way of keeping food on the table. And so those folks are already part of a very specific population. Now, if we continue to run this, this program, and we hope that we will, and so far this week we have a thousand doses and they're all prescribed. If we continue this program, there may be a potential that we would ask for that. But at this point, there's not a, a way to sign up uh, specifically for uh, for the homebound senior program, right? Don't call 911. Don't call 311 because it's basically through Saha and Meals on Wheels how people are, right. are getting registered right now. We're going to continue our Q&A on the other side of this break. We'll be right back. We're back now with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg. Mayor, we talked earlier in the show about how because of another delay in vaccine shipments, Appointments now at the Alamo Dome are going to be pushed back, but there's the possibility of maybe some popping up if people miss their appointments, which happens. So what does happen in that instance to that appointment slot and especially that vaccine uh, that was ready and available for that person? Well, it, it, it's obviously extremely important that if you get an appointment, you you keep your appointment um, in the event that your dose uh, or your your appointment has to be rescheduled because a dose hasn't arrived, you will be rescheduled by Metro Health reaching out to you. Uh, no shows, unfortunately, put uh, everything at risk in terms of uh, ruining of the vaccine. Uh, so those appointments are actually um, given to somebody else who's been waiting. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of if you miss an appointment, if you did not show up for your appointment, you will have to re-register. Uh, so we really don't want to, we really want to limit that uh, from occurring. Talk a little bit about, I, we talked about it last week, about the rodeo coming up, and I know it's not your jurisdiction, but the uh, county judge sent a letter to rodeo organizers expressing his concern that he said he'd already expressed verbally. Your reaction to that letter from County Judge Nelson Wolf? I mean, I, I thought it was uh, a wisely written letter, um, you know, and, and, and the judge and I have tried to, every step of the way, be guided by uh, sober realities with regard to protecting people's health and the guidance that we're getting from the public health professionals. And you, what you heard the judge talk about is that if events are going to occur, they need to be done in, a, in, in um, adherence to the public health guidelines. And it is going to be very difficult to, to do that uh, over the, the course of a two-week event. Uh, if they do move forward, there are strict guidelines that need to be maintained and they need to be enforced and people need to be aware of that. And if you're not going to adhere to those guidelines, you need to not go. Uh, it just puts an extra burden on uh, enforcement to conduct an activity like that. And, you know, and, and you know, the, the, the pains that we went through uh, to enforce the Alamo, uh, Alamo Bowl event and we had several people removed. That's the kind of activity you're going to see every single night and it's going to put a burden on enforcement activity and people need to be aware of that. Just about a week and a half from what's supposed to be the start of the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, as always, thanks so much for being with us this evening. Good to be with y'all. We'll be right back. The news around America, Google agreeing to pay almost $4 million to settle a discrimination lawsuit. The technology company accused of discriminating against women and Asian candidates for engineering roles in some of its West Coast offices. It's also accused of pay discrimination. The allegations arose from routine compliance reviews between 2014 to 2017. 
Google says it remains committed to diversity and equity and says everyone should be paid based on the work they do, not who they are. Amazon is going to be writing a big check and a settlement with the Federal Trade Commission to pay Amazon flex delivery drivers more than $61 million. The settlement comes in the wake of hundreds of complaints the FTC says it received from the drivers. The e-commerce giant advertised hourly pay from $18 to $25 for its flex drivers, plus 100 percent of the tips that they earn. FTC officials say the company reduced that hourly pay, then used tips to cover the difference. Amazon disputes that it was unclear in its statements about driver pay and says the average Amazon flex driver earns more than $25 an hour. A little bit of patchy fog in the morning, otherwise a sunny day tomorrow, 45 in the morning, 73 by the afternoon. So a comfortable day. We get into Thursday. We talked about it being the warmest day right up near 80. Then a series of cool fronts really drops us back to where we should be this time of year. All right, thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the News at 6. See you on the night beat at 10.